By a show of hand, how many of you have been asked a million dollar question? Do you know the one I'm talking about? I have a million dollar question? It's only a few of them. So how many of you actually were asked and were comfortable that the answer was correct? Not many? Well, that's because you didn't get paid the million dollar when you answered that question, right? And I got that question so many times that I made it purposely one of the most complicated questions to ever be asked. So anyone who asks me a million dollar question, it's like, sorry, I can't afford it. It's like, no, 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 we have a million dollar question. I was like, okay, is that cash or check? And who's gonna pay the VAT? <laughs> the purpose of that question, and that story is purpose itself. Because every time you ask that question, you start thinking, what do they really want to hear? Where is the right answer? There is a famous quote by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the Prime Minister of the UAE and the ruler of Dubai, that if an individual is allowed to set his own goal, then they will definitely achieve that goal. The simple philosophy behind this is that every individual knows their capabilities, their limitations, and with the right internal motivation, then they will achieve this goal, no doubt. 20 years ago, when I was still living with my parents, more than 20 years ago, I missed my curfew once. I say I was five minutes late, my mom says 50. Who's right, we will never know. But there was only one person allowed to lock the doors at home, and that was mother. So when I arrived home and the door was locked, I knew I was going to get in trouble. Luckily, my grandmother lives next door. So I seeked the oldest type of political asylum. <laughs> now, for those who know me, they will tell you, Sultan never lies. But they will also tell you, Sultan never ever volunteers the entire truth. So I went to my grandmother and I told her the basic facts. I was late, door is locked, I need a place to sleep. Moments later, my parents arrive, furious, thinking that I came to complain. And the good old lady said, no, he just wanted a place to sleep. He's like, it's okay, he can come home now. I was like, okay, hold on, I need to take advantage of this. <laughs> my purpose at that moment was not to get a beating when I got home. And to sign the deal, I told them, I want to have breakfast with my grandmother tomorrow morning. <laughs> so any physical bruises will be visible. Fast forward 20 years, I was recruited by the Prime Minister office to establish the government accelerators. The first time that the government has an open door policy for teams to come and work in together from the public sector, from the private sector, NGOs, education, from 8 a.m. until midnight. Business as usual suggests when you get stuck at projects, you either throw more money, more resources, to make sure you meet your deadline, because you don't have time. But when we came with a new approach that said, no extra budget, and we're gonna deliver more tangible result in less time, the way the government thinks and works, changed forever. There were so many different challenges that the country was facing that had exponential social impact. Three years ago, there was 800 kindergarten students on waiting lists because the seating capacity in certain areas in Dubai could not accommodate them. Business as usual, let's build more schools. So, more time, more money, more resources needed to go into that project. Instead, the stakeholders came together and presented the challenge and agreed to uh, appoint a team. And the team was given the task to choose their goal. And the team decided that within 100 days, they're going to eliminate that waiting list they started utilizing all the available resources, the unused spaces. They speed up the recruitment process for teachers. They recycled books, they recycled furniture. And guess what? Within 50 days, 
They didn't only eliminate and enroll 800 students, but they've increased the seating capacity for those areas by 2,000 additional seats. They've identified the challenge, they've set the right purpose for them, and they moved on. One day while I was working with my team, an old woman comes in the traditional Emirati clothes and the golden burga, a spitting image of my late grandmother. And she asks the receptionist, like, where's the manager? He points her my way. She walks up to me and she asks me one question. What did you do? Someone asks you that question out of the blue, you start thinking of every mistake you've done in your life. <laughs> From missing my curfew 20 years ago. So I took a deep breath. I was like, how can I help you? Turned out she was a grandmother of one of the team members of that accelerator team that worked on the kindergarten challenge. And she came to tell me a story. She's been living with her granddaughter for years. And her granddaughter works in a school, but she's never seen her smile. She's never seen any emotional expression. She never talked about her work. But for the past 100 days, she wouldn't shut up about the accelerators. It's like, that's a good thing, yes. It's like, so what did you do? How did you do it? And can you please keep doing it? Because I've never seen true purpose in the eyes of my granddaughter. That was, to us, the pride moment and the unintended results that we love to see. Other than having that purpose, there was some secret spices that added to the formula. These success factors from the crisis mode and sense of urgency as a team who were working within 100 days to enroll those kindergarten students, to the yes and mentality, the build up, the acceptance of ideas, and the proactive approach. But it was also very important to have the right mix of people empowered and to get the people closest to the problem to solve those problems. And I'll tell you another team story, and this one is actually very moving. The Ministry of Health reports on a KPI, deaths from diseases. And one of the most dangerous cancers that the world is always facing is breast cancer. A remote city in the UAE had 6,000 ladies above the age of 40 that never done their screenings, which put them at very high risk. So a team was assembled between the private sector, the public sector, Pink Caravan sponsored the team. There were volunteers from that town as well. And they've decided that within 100 days, they're going to screen 1,000 ladies. They put their heads together, and the team started working nonstop. Massive campaigns. By day 50, they have just reached 100 ladies, and they had 50 days to go. The team was devastated. They've done everything by the book. Social media campaigns, running billboard ads. They've actually built a mobile screening uh, truck to move in the neighborhoods to help ladies who cannot move or cannot have access to hospital. The team then decided to go down to that city and knock on doors and ask, What's the problem? What's happening? And the true purpose of that team became much more clear. The most common question, what if you're asking us all to go and do screenings, but what happens next? What if we test positive? What are we going to do? So overnight, the entire communication strategy of that team changed, and they started bringing in cancer survivors to tell their stories. By the day 100, they have actually screened 2,202 ladies. They've doubled their goal in 50 days. Out of those, four was positive, three were benign, and one was fully cured and recovered. So many lessons can be learned from more than 40 teams that worked on those challenges. But these are also things that we know and we've done in our life. The assets that we have, Time is one of them. And time is available equally to every single one of us. But it's also the only resource that cannot be stored. 
the Arabic old saying, time is like a sword. If you don't chop it, it chops you. It's sometimes lost in translation, but it basically means if you are not wise about your time, you will end up chopped up into pieces working on so many different things. Resources, and other than financial resources, the abundance of resources available to us in this day and age that we take for granted, I'll give you two examples. Decades ago, traveling between cities can take months. Now you can book a ticket on your phone while you're sitting here, and by tomorrow morning you'll be in London or New York. Simple toothache can take months to treat, and if it's not treatable decades ago, your tooth will be removed and you will live in pain and agony for months. In this day and age, it will take you one hour to get rid of that pain. So with those two examples, we need to realize that we are actually living in better lives with better resources than kings of the old times. One of my uh, favorite movie quotes is from the movie Fight Club. And this takes me to the final pillar, money. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. <laughs> have you ever wondered how financially intelligent are you? Social intelligence is something that we pick up from the kindergarten, the playground, all the way to our working environment with our peers. Emotional intelligence has been pushed at everyone by human resources departments like they are the skill of the century. But no one ever stopped to say, how financially intelligent are you? Are you in control of your money or is it in control of you? Do we really understand the value of products and services or do we accept whatever evaluation that's thrown upon us? All of those things combined will make you think about your priorities. And when you think about priorities, in the great words of uh, the Mahatma Gandhi, actions create priorities. And why do we need to prioritize? Because it's our true purpose in life to know what we are doing right now and what we will be doing tomorrow. And simply uh, quoting Stephen Covey, the key is not to prioritize what's in our schedule but it's to schedule our priorities. Thank you very much.